Hi, everybody, and welcome again to Stepping Into What's Next, our biblical study, our Bible study about this big term we are going to continue to talk about, which is liminality. I'm going to share my screen now just to do a quick review of what this term means for those who haven't been with us the past couple of sessions and how we're going to think about it, particularly today. Are you all seeing a picture of a door right now? Not yet. I still have now? this. We do now. I got this yes. door. We do yeah. now. Okay. All right. So the word liminality comes from the Latin word for threshold. So here's our picture of a door, and you're seeing the stop, the panels, the casing, the door jam, and then here at the bottom is the threshold. So limen is Latin for the word threshold. And so when we're in liminal times and liminal spaces, we have, we're leaving what was, but haven't quite made it into what's next. And so we're kind of sitting here or standing here at the threshold and this in-between space and a lot can happen in that space we have a lot of emotion being in this in-between space that comes up kind of spontaneously in ways we can't control we may be tempted to try to resolve that anxiety with all kinds of things last week we talked about abram um, who will later become known as Abraham, and the journey to Canaan. And particularly looking at one of the temptations of being in a liminal space is that we want to efficiently get through it as quickly as we possibly can. What we see in the story of Abram, um, in the beginning part of his journey, um, he, his and his family's journey to Canaan, is that Abram stops every so often and builds an altar. He does work to tend his soul, to nurture his connection with himself, with his community, and with the God who had invited him into taking up this journey in the first place. And so last week we talked about tending the soul. This week we're going to talk about deepening discernment in liminal spaces, what it means to discern when we're in these threshold in-between moments. And so I'm going to ask y'all, before we move any deeper into that conversation, let's just define that term together, or at the very least, just talk together about what that term means. When you hear the word discernment, what comes up for you? Put another way, how would you describe what it means to discern? Yeah, Paul. Okay, technical difficulties. Truth. When I'm trying to discern something or thinking about the, the word discernment, what is true for me about this? That's That's how I decide. Yeah, thank you for that, Paul. What's true? So discerning is about beginning, maybe ending with what's true. Okay, that's great. Anyone uh, else want to add another Tony, layer? Yeah, John. Tony, uh, for me, uh, the process of discernment uh, generally begins with, okay, what is it in my makeup that is either attracted to this or pushes it away. Why do I have those two things? Uh, which of those two things is this about? And how is that hooked up to my own ego, everything else for all these years? And so for discernment, I've got to, because uh, a lot of times I'll just, uh, start going off about something and then decide, discern this is the way and then all of a sudden 
the grandmas, we, Joanne and I call them the grandmas, kind of oh, like, like she was uh, saying, oh, it might be a, a, a word that pops up in reading. It could be the, oh, gorgeous sunrise that comes up that you didn't expect. Uh, and we always say, that's the grandmas <laughs> speaking to us. Mm. And uh, this time of year, Pentecost is my favorite because the Holy Spirit speaks. <laughs> if, if you listen, it's really something. That's all. That's, that's great, John. Thank you so much. And it's, you're picking up on some of the threads that we, we've mm -hmm. already named in the conversation. You, you're naming as the grandmas, but to me, it sounds like it connects very much with Anne's commentary and about yes, signs, yes. you know, seeing signs out in the world. Um, and also Diane's conversation about uh, the ancestors, connecting with ancestors. Um, and so having these voices be part of a process of discernment as we make our way toward truth. Yeah, it's beautiful. Anyone else want to add another layer? to our kind of working definition for what discerning is. One thing that came to my mind was, um, you know, picking out the weeds. You know, it's like mm -hmm. in gardening that, you know, you want to see what you're growing. And so, you know, and the weeds being like John was saying, your past history, what you're bringing to something that might cloud the truth. Um, and you're just trying to pull all those out. Yeah, that's that's great. That's a, it's a helpful image too to think about kind of being in the garden and discerning what's something you want there and what's a weed. Yeah, absolutely. Melinda, what were you thinking about? Clarification. Clarification and, and clarity. I mean, it's the same, but it's just, yeah, the clarification of everything. Yeah, absolutely. Trying to get clarity in the midst of, because when dilemmas come, often if they're very big dilemmas, there can be a lot of confusion and chaos. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to show y'all, um, you know, as someone who, um, I don't know if you are aware of this, but the app dictionary.com has a word of the day. And if you're a word nerd like I am, you get that and you read it and you delight in it. And one of the things that I often go to um, in trying to do a process of, of understanding things is look at the etymology of the words. And so take a look at um, the etymology of the word discernment, particularly as it relates to decision, because discernment and decision making we often kind of collapse them as being two different sides of the same coin, or in some cases, synonyms, that they're basically the exact same thing. But here, take a look at the etymology of these two different words, actually, and they'll give us, I think, an interesting insight into how these two processes are actually really different. So, you look here, the word discern comes from the Latin discernere, which means to separate, to sift, kind of the way we were talking uh, just a minute ago with Diane's metaphor of being in the garden and taking out the weeds, sifting through what we want to keep and what we don't. Decide, however, comes from the Latin word caidere, which means to strike or cut down. It comes to us in English and other places as basically a form of um, a suffix that means killing. So a pesticide is uh, something that kills, cuts down pests. Homicide, um, patricide, suicide, infanticide, all of these are words that are grounded in this Latin term, which means to strike or cut down. And so now this isn't meant to say, you don't mean to set up a binary here where discerning is always good. And when you decide something, it's the same as murder. That's not what I'm trying to suggest here. However, if you think about what happens in a decision, you basically choose something and exclude something else. 
you strike down something else. You strike down uncertainty. You strike down anxiety, maybe. Um, and or at the very least, you strike down the alternatives for what could be. Any thoughts or feedback, questions about just this distinction here between discernment and decision making? Okay, let's let's go a little deeper then into um, what folks have said discernment is really all about. So, according to Henry Nowen, who is a spiritual teacher and Christian mm -hmm. scholar, this is what he has to say about mm -hmm. what discernment is in his book titled Discernment. Discernment is a spiritual understanding and an experiential knowledge of how God is active in daily life. And that spiritual understanding and that experiential knowledge is acquired through disciplined spiritual practice. We actively wait for the spirit to move and prompt us, and then we discern what we are to do next. When we see ourselves in a relationship of love with God, there is always something of a lover's dilemma, a struggle to give and to receive, to trust and to obey the call. So there's a dynamic here where discernment is deeply rooted in spiritual practice. And we do it in order to understand at an experiential level how God is acting in our daily lives. Danny Morris and Chuck Olson, so Christian spiritual teachers and leaders, they write that to discern is to see through to the essence of a matter, maybe the truth, as we might call it. Discernment distinguishes the real from the phony, the true from the false, the good from the evil, and the path toward God from the path away from God. So we get a sense here where, again, discernment is this action of sifting through to understand and get at the essence of a particular question, a particular dilemma, a particular reality. So today, what we're going to be looking at in terms of our scriptural passage is the story of the golden calf and a little context. We're at a moment in the book of Exodus, we're in chapter 32, a lot's happened up until this point. The Israelites have made their way out of, G uh, out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, they are in the desert, and Moses has gone up to Mount Sinai to commune and speak with God. And Moses has been gone for a very long time. Meanwhile, the Israelites are getting antsy because they're in this space of uncertainty. So here's how the story goes. Exodus chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come, make us gods, or this little um, superscript here, that could also be translated as God, as a God, who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, okay, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them all to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods or God Israel who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down, because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. 
They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Let's pause right here and talk a little bit together. What stands out to you as you read this passage with me or hear it read? Anything jump out at your attention? Um, what comes to mind uh, about discernment and about what happened um, in this story, parable, metaphor, um, mm -hmm. we, we have a tendency when we're at a threshold of something of making a judgment not a judgment in a good way, but a judgment. Uh, oh. We take, we reach out and we're usually impatient. It, that's usually what's driving us. And we, we don't want to wait anymore. We don't want to let things unfold. So we make a judgment and we act and we do not discern uh, what might be the better uh decision and i just can't help but go back to <clears throat> it's a natural behavior in youth but as you get older and older you see that your first reactions your first uh reactions are not discernment they're just judgments of mm -hmm. how you want it to be Mm -hmm. Not how it is, but how you want it to be. Mm -hmm. And you take hold and you make something happen. And without, without further ado, I'm sure we can all remember decisions we made that were just, <laughs> we don't know what we were thinking at the time because it, they were disastrous. But uh, it, it, we, we try to be open as we as we grow and unfold and age. I I have to speak for age. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's really helpful. Um, I think that's really helpful, Joanne, because what you're naming here is that that tendency to make snap judgments mm -hmm. in, when, we're, when we're in these kind of liminal spaces um, when we start to feel like okay, we're ready for this to be over now. Yeah. Thank you for that. Anyone? Well, else? Yeah. What, what came to my mind, too, is that they are in that liminal space, and it's very uncomfortable. And so the first thing they want to do is get out of it. And so it's on to the next, uh, who's going to lead us in this? Yeah, that's right. Not only, that's, that's a good point, Diane. Not only do they um, abandon God, Yahweh, they also abandon Moses. They're like, Aaron, all right, now you're the guy. You, you lead us. But that was my question. I thought Aaron was uh, Moses' right-hand man, and yet he also jumps the gun. Right. He just said, <laughs> yes. Like, well, wait a minute. You know, I mean, Aaron, you know, and I mean, he's with the people. It's like, you know, go, go, let's go do this, you know, as opposed to like, let's wait. And that backs me back up to what Joanne was saying. And, and here it is, Pat, this is how I think of discernment. And this is what I've asked in this, this segment of my life, Lord, bless me with patience and discernment because I equate, uh, equate being patient with discerning, you know, Absolutely. There's there's an element of waiting that's part yes. of discernment. And in order to do that graciously and gracefully, we need patience. And were you, Ann Hagler, were you about to say something? I was just, um, I'll just underline kind of what Francine said in terms of waiting. I think the passage says a lot about our um, mm, unwillingness, inability, I don't know what it is, but whatever we don't wait very well no, you know yeah. even even when we've been told by an esteemed leader like moses you know <laughs> to wait wait i mean you know wait until i get back um we don't we just um 
we get um, we get antsy, we get we get nervous, we get um, tired, we get bored, you know. And so we we're perfectly willing to make something happen. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Ann. Yeah, um, Carla. Well, um, for the if there's any biblically illiterate people here like me, Marcia just mentioned that this all happened before Moses came down with the tablets. Right. So the, the people had not been told. No graven images. No graven images, <laughs> which I never knew. I never connected those two things. So they, I mean, it, 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 I always kind of heard this story and thought you morons, they've already told you not to do this, <laughs> but they hadn't told them not to do this. So a little sympathy for the Israelites. Oh, it's really true. And, you know, there are some scholars who look at this and they say, well, maybe the Israelites weren't actually creating another God. Maybe they just decided to create an image of Yahweh, which is whenever, whenever we see this word Lord here um, in all caps, it's a fill in for the Hebrew word Yahweh, which is a name for God. And and so, yeah, I think there's there's certainly a more charitable reading of this passage that suggests, well, the Israelites didn't really know what they were doing. And maybe what they did was just create an embodied golden image of of their God rather than creating something else. Uh, so it's 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 an interesting way to look at this passage for sure. Um, but there was there's that still that piece in here about the fact that Moses asked them to wait and they were like, all right, we're done waiting. We're now Aaron fix this for us. Um, and so, well, before we move on, anyone else wanted to name something that stuck out to them? Yeah, Marsha. Uh, yeah, I wanted to stick up for Aaron a little bit. Um, he was, he was with that nervous, impatient, antsy crowd and they, there were more of them and just him and and he was the right hand man of of Moses so he had a, he had a job to do and he was faced with this unruly crowd and he came up with a very quick answer and it's almost a funny ludicrous scene where he says take off all your jewelry hurry up put it in this pile melt it down let's make a thing and we'll have a party and it's like he was a psychologist. He knew what to do with all that nervous energy and give him a focus uh, to my time. And maybe he kind of knew that God would intervene and say, you know what, uh, we need to we need to resolve this brewing conflict. But Aaron did the best he could, and I thought it was kind of funny what he what he came up with. He kept their hands busy. <laughs> well, I wouldn't have given him all my gold jewelry, but <laughs> they they were they did it, you know. And it's it's very really interesting to, to see that that's the move that he makes. But I appreciate that, Marcia, that you kind of giving a charitable reading of of Aaron and how he's caught in his own dilemma as a leader. You know, what do I do with this group of people who are grumbling and antsy and anxious? Um, and so he he came up with a plan. Yeah. And we're, we're going to talk a little bit in just a moment about the, the very things that y'all are naming, about patience, about um, our tendency to feel anxiety when we're in liminal spaces, and the temptation uh, that we face in that liminal space is to very quickly resolve that anxiety. And we'll talk about some strategies that we use. Before we do that, though, Let's let's follow up a little bit more with Moses's and and God's dialogue here. So God tells Moses to go down and um, and and basically fix this issue. And then following up, the Lord says, I have seen these people and they are stiff necked people. Now, leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. So God's ready to just kill everybody again, as we've seen happen with the story of the flood and, and elsewhere. But Moses actually seeks favor with God. 
Lord, Moses says, why should your anger burn against your people, whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that God brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, God. Relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster that God had threatened. We'll leave it there for now because a whole lot more happens and spoiler alert many people do eventually get slain uh, not everyone though but nevertheless what sticks out to you about this moment here in this exchange between god and and moses in this exchange pastor god appears to be human like uh-huh i mean he's angry yeah. You know, he, he's, he's letting a human uh, a, uh, settle him down, you know, to, it's like, oh, so God, you too can, can, uh, you know, be human like, and that's what I got out of this. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it, Fran? Because in a way, what we see is God needing a little bit of time yes. to discern. Yes. Yeah. Because God's ready to just jump in there and fix his feelings too. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really feeling his early on HR problems here and what the situation's <laughs> like. He's got a tough little road to hoe here. Uh, we're kind of seeing the foundations getting laid uh, <laughs> some more. Yeah, yeah, it's true. So what we have here is Moses actually changes God's mind yeah. by reminding God of the promises that God had made. Yeah, and what God's guiding principles were and and that actually changes god's mind as they move forward anyone else have something they want to name about this moment here well what came to my mind was when you were talking about uh, discernment and decision that decision was homicide uh, and it, it plays out in this well, it's kind of true. Yeah, that's that's an interesting connection there, um, Diane, where the decision in this case isn't just connected by its Latin root to striking down. But in this instance, God decides to strike the Israelites down. And thanks to Moses, God doesn't. Uh, Tony. Yeah, I, have, I have a question um, <clears throat> concerning uh, who wrote this down? Uh, the five books that make up the Torah, is that correct? So there yes, Exodus, Exodus yes. is one of those books and it's considered the five <laughs> the first five books of the Hebrew scriptures are considered the five books of Moses. And right. so tradition holds that Moses wrote this. However, what most scholars believe is that the Bible and the Holy uh, or the Hebrew scriptures in particular were not compiled until much later after the time period that's being described here. And there are some folks who go so far as to say that this passage in particular was written and recorded and shared at a time at which um, King Jeroboam, who was one of the first kings of Israel, was considering um, making the worship of cows part of the Israelite religion. And so some folks believe that this story is recorded in this way as a way to suggest that that was the wrong choice and that the Israelites need to refrain from this form of worship. Well, are you, my question is, Partly, was Moses literate? Did he read? Did he write? Did the king you speak of, did he read? Did he write? Or uh, when did writing and reading come into being? Uh, I'm just throwing this out here because uh, what you just said 
it, of course, expands the background on the calf itself, which that makes sense, but it's very difficult to, well, for instance, just using the word threshold, that just conjures up all kinds of um, situations that we encounter every day. It's just, I have a um, reluctance to put too much emphasis on, for instance, God getting angry. Um, I just, that just doesn't compute for me. And uh, I accept it's a story, I accept it's a metaphor, uh, I accept it's a parable, but it just raises questions in me. And if I had to explain it to a young person, I, don't, I, I would just have to pass. I, I wouldn't know what to say. Yeah, these That's moments, all. Yeah, I appreciate that, um, Joanne, because these moments where we see God getting angry um, these moments where we see God threatening to kill an entire group of people, or in the case of the flood, uh, all of humanity save one family. Yeah, it can be hard to reconcile that with our understanding of God at a spiritual level. But I think that, you know, what you're pointing us to as, as well is the fact that these are stories that are recorded for a particular purpose. And uh, even if we don't necessarily conceive of or experience God in the ways that are being described here, what we can still discern our way into are forms of truth that resonate throughout these scriptures all the way up until our time now. And so there are lots of ways to resolve that kind of tension. One is to say, well, God changed. I mean, we're seeing God change in this very story. Another way to resolve it is to say, well, this, is, this was a group of people's way of understanding what happened to them throughout their history. And so their God becomes a character in their story as a people. And so we don't necessarily have to derive spiritual lessons about God's nature from this in particular, this particular encounter. But again, we can learn something about how human beings work at a basic level, what our temptations are when we're in these sorts of liminal threshold in between spaces, and how we might approach resolving them. In God's case, he did what many of y'all talked about doing when you're resolving dilemmas. He listened. God listened to the people around him and decided that God was going to go a different way. Um, what Ultimately happens, though, you know, really the pitfall of being in a time like this is as we see what the Israelites did was to resolve their dilemma by turning it into a problem, a very specific, discrete problem that was Moses is gone. We need something to worship. Aaron, fix it. That's one way to describe the dilemma the Israelites were facing. It's a problem, but it brings up a question. How else might y'all describe? How else might we describe what the, the heart of this story is about? What's the dilemma that's going on here? There's no right or wrong answer. I'm, I'm just curious what y'all's take on that might be. Pastor Marcia's had her hand up a bit. Oh, I'm sorry, Marcia. Go ahead. I didn't see you. I was just going to make a quick response to Joanne um, about having to uh, explain this to children. Yeah. If, if you read this children or tell this, this story to young people, um, don't try to explain it to them. Just say, what do you think of this? And then just listen to the children. It's fascinating. Sure, it would be. And I'm sure it would be very instructive in addition to being fascinating. <laughs> The other Marsha. Just... Yes, oh. other Marsha. Another Marsha. <laughs> um, I'm struck by the deal that most died, that there's an interaction between the uh, so called higher power of God and this human power of the human, and they're negotiating and they're working together. And to me, that's a metaphor for 
for consciousness, for human consciousness, for God and human consciousness coming together somehow. I, I just like to see it that way. That interaction, there's deliberation that's happening. There's discernment going on in that exchange right there. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I'm going to, um, just given our time, talk a little bit um, and by way of summary about some of the, the highlights of what this Thanks. story and this situation um, really invite us to consider. And so one of the things that we see happening here is that the Israelites are facing a dilemma. The, and, and again, there's lots of different ways we can phrase and frame what that dilemma is. Maybe the dilemma is the anxiety that results from their leader, this person who helped them leave Egypt and bondage is gone. And they don't know where he is. So maybe there's a dilemma around grief here that's happening. Maybe there's also the dilemma around worship and what worship is supposed to look like without their main leader. What do we do with this? And so what often happens, or one of the, the hazards of being in a liminal in-between space is that when we face those sorts of dilemmas, anxiety arises. And one of the ways that we try to deal with that anxiety is by turning a, a big dilemma into a discrete, definable problem. And so now there's a problem. The Israelites say to Aaron, we don't know where Moses is. Make us gods who will go before us. And so Aaron, taking their lead, says, okay, I will try to solve this problem. And that's the other thing that we do when we're in between spaces. That's one of the other hazards. We let our anxiety turn a dilemma into a specific problem, and then we try to solve that problem, often by using information, using experiences that we already have or already have had. And so what a lot of biblical scholars have pointed to is that the idea of worshiping a cow didn't come out of nowhere. In fact, worship of cows was a big part of Egyptian religion. And so this is a statue of a cow that was this um, an embodiment of the Egyptian god Apis, who was worshipped primarily in Memphis, Egypt. And so some scholars believe that this, this story actually points to the Israelites just saying, okay, fine, let's just go back to what we know. This God, Yahweh, not really sure what's going on here. Moses, there's like this mysterious, who knows? But what we do know is the worship of cows. And so some scholars suggest that that's why there was this move to form this, this, uh, all of this gold into a calf. And so again, it's, it's perfectly human behavior. When we're in this uncertainty, we retreat back to what we already know. And so I want to, by way of summary here, as we, as we finish up, just talk more specifically about the differences between decision-making and discernment. So, when we're in the throes of decision making, and again, this isn't to say that decision making is bad. It's about appropriateness. So there are times when we are facing issues that we can resolve and that we should resolve as quickly as possible. How are we going to pay our bills? How are we going to renovate our kitchen? How are we going to get from here to our vacation place. Those are decisions that we need to make. The process that we do is we discuss. We talk about the risks, we talk about the pros and cons, and then we allocate resources. We get everybody's golden earrings and golden necklaces, and then we create a cow. Who does that work? Leaders, the authorized leaders. In the story, who do they talk to? Aaron. Aaron, here's our problem. We want you to fix it. Discernment, on the other hand, takes a different approach. 
the, in discernment, there's an assumption that God is at work in the dilemma, even if we can't immediately see how God is at work. And so the process is about broadening our focus. So rather than looking at the, the question, this dilemma of we're feeling an absence of our leader, of our connection with God, that's a discernment question that we could turn into a decision question by saying, all right, well, how do we fix this? The discernment question though is, well, what do we want our relationship to God to be like? What do we, what have we experienced already of God's power and presence and love? And so we broaden our focus through prayer, through worship, through meditation, through scripture reading, through discussion perhaps, through listening and ultimately through slowing down, through that patience, that, that waiting we've been talking about. Who does that work? Everybody who's invested in it. And so maybe if it's just you, then it's you and all the voices that are in your head. They're all part of the conversation. The voices of your parents. Her influences the voices of your your truth what we see though here uh oh did i freeze can you all hear me mm -hmm. yeah you froze just a little bit oh there we go can you all hear me now okay yes um what we see is that life is and part of what the work is is to discern and to decide even how we're going to approach answering those questions and so i'm going to invite y'all between now and the next time we get together or just whenever you can to think about a question that's come up for you. Maybe it's a question you're asking yourself. Maybe it's a question your family's asking you or your friends are asking you. Maybe it's a question you feel as though God Think about how you might approach it as a kind of discernment. How might you approach this question through the lens of discernment rather than through the lens of just simple decision-making? Did that, did, did that get chopped up with my internet connection or were you able to hear it? Good enough. Good enough, yeah. Good enough, okay. All right, y'all. Well, thank you so much for your feedback, for your thoughts, for your insights along the way. Um, this has been really rich. <laughs> thank you, Tony. All right. I'm just gonna cut my losses at this point and say thank you. And I hope you have a wonderful week and we'll talk again soon. Hey, right. Tony. Thank you, Tony. Bye. Bye-bye. Hey, Diane. This has been excellent. I just yeah. want you to know. Oh, thank that, you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very helpful. I'm so glad. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. Pastor Tony, while I got you, what was that book that you had suggested to read Sunday? something passion the um the wisdom pattern the, oh pattern that's it okay the wisdom pattern got it and right. it kind of talks about um a lot of the topics in one bible study okay. um richard Rohr talks about how there's this pattern of moving from order to disorder to reorder all right and he kind of looks at a bunch of different ways that shows up Gotcha. Yeah. All right, y'all. Well, you have a wonderful rest of the day. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.